Now, the greatest radio shows of all time. Suspense. The Shadow Node. Washington calling David Harding, counter spy. Classic radio theater. The Great Gildersleeve. Fibber McGee and Molly. Dragnet. Gunsmoke. The Lone Ranger. Now, step back into our time machine with your host, Wyatt Cox. Good evening, friends of the Inner Sanctum. Well, the head of the Marie Wilson fan club is going to be happy today. We have an episode this hour of uh, My Friend Irma, starring Marie Wilson. This episode goes back to February 9th, 1948, and it seems that Al has bought himself a boxer. And we're not talking about a dog. Lieber Brothers Company, makers of Swan, the soap with the exclusive super-creamed blend, presents... Our friend, Swan, with my friend, Irma. Starring Marie Wilson as Irma and Kathy Lewis as Jane. Friendship, friendship, just a perfect blendship when other friendships have been forgot. Theirs will still be hot. population the size of New York's, there are bound to be many people like yourself. But of one thing I'm certain, in all New York, yes, in all the world, there can only be one Irma Peterson. (laughs) How do I know? Because only one person thinks like my beloved roommate. For instance, the other day I was reading the newspaper and I said, Irma. Yes, Jane? Listen to this headline in the paper, Higher Meat Prices Predicted for 1948. Isn't that awful? Oh, it sure is, Jane. It's going to give a lot of people an inferiority complex. Inferiority complex? Yes, I heard that the human body is only worth 97 cents. Why should a cow be any better than you or me? (laughs) I would try to find an answer for that, but right now I'm more concerned with Irma's heart than her mind. You see, Valentine's Day is nearly here, and with the approach of any holiday with the least romantic significance, Irma becomes certain that Al is going to propose. She felt that way on Mother's Day, (laughs) on Father's Day, in fact, on every holiday except Labor Day. (laughs) She knows that that's the day when Al hides. But I know that she's banking heavily on the culmination of her dreams this Valentine's Day because right now she's down on her knees in front of her hope chest, examining its contents. Believe me, such contents no human eye has ever seen in a hope chest. In one corner, she has stacked bottles of root beer, mission orange, cherry soda, and Cokes. Irma, what is the idea? Well, when maybe when Al sees all that pop, you'll want to become a father. <laughs> I see. And what about that calendar, honey? You've torn off all 12 months. Why? Well, they say when you get married, the first year is the hardest, and I don't want to know about it. (laughs) Sweetie, I don't want to be cruel, but what makes you think that Al is going to leap into action now? Valentine's Day is coming. Oh, honey, you said the same thing about leap year. You were going to land him on the first day of leap year. Well, it was fate. I was a good leaper, but he was a better ducker. Irma, do you seriously intend to marry Al? The moment he asks me. You intend to have children, don't you? Six. Six? Four of each. (laughs) There may be twins, you know. Yeah, well, that's what I'm driving at, honey. You see, children need food, they need clothes, they need education. Well, I was going to educate them myself. I know, honey, but after kindergarten... (laughs) Well, then Al will take over. All right, then after reform school... (laughs) Oh, look, Jane, I I know what you say is is true, but I love Al and I want to marry him. I'm just going to let the future take care of itself. Oh, Irma, this Now, please, Jane, my mind is made up. Oh, gee, I'd better hurry to the beauty parlor. I'll be late. Honey, why do you keep spending money on the beauty parlor? You have such wonderful, naturally curly blonde hair. Yes, but people keep saying there's there's so much that needs to be done to my head. (laughs) See you later. Hello. Oh, 
Oh, it's you, Al. Uh-uh, she just left for the beauty parlor. She'll be right back. What? You're shopping for her Valentine present? What would she like? Gee, I don't know. Uh, where are you shopping? Near Tiffany's? How near Tiffany's? <laughs> oh, the five and ten. <laughs> well, look, Al, will you come over here? There's something very important that I want to discuss with you, huh? Yeah, while Irma's gone. Please hurry, will you? Bye. Come in. It's only me, Professor Kropotkin. <laughs> Jenny, I hope I'm not intruding. No, Professor, not at all. What's on your mind? Well, I'm going away for a week, and I want to sublet my room. Does this ad read right? Well, let me hear it. Wanted gentleman to sublet room. Must be insane. <laughs> oh, Professor, don't be so dramatic. If there's as much wrong with your room as you say, why call Mrs. O'Reilly up and put your foot down? This is impossible. If I put my foot down in that room, I go right through the floor. <laughs> Professor, I sympathize with you, but I've got other things on my mind. What's wrong with Irma now? Well, she's made up her mind that she's going to marry Al. And you are worried that he won't be able to make a living for her? Huh? Well, you know how long it's been since he worked. Yes, that was when the Normandy turned over. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and he tried to sell the life preservers for white wall tires. <laughs> uh, Janie, you've got to be philosophical. You know, there is an old saying... All the world is a stage. How does that apply? It don't. This is only a consolation if you ain't got money to go to the movies. Um, that's Al. That's Al. Uh, professor, I'm expecting him. Uh, come in. Oh, Jane. Oh, hiya, Professor. Hello, Al. Well, I got to be running along. Don't you want to hear about my new deal? Look, another deal he's got. What is it this time? Shaving cats and selling them for Mexican chihuahuas? <laughs> I stopped tampering with animals, but got a natural. It's a pair of binoculars with built-in pictures of pinup girls. So when a dame drags her husband to the opera, he'll have something to look at. <laughs> How's it sound? Like all the others. <laughs> now, if you'll excuse me, I'll go up to my room and feed my birds. Birds? What kind of birds do you have? I don't know. When you haven't got any windows, you don't know what you're going to get. <laughs> Well, Jane, what did you want to see me about that's so important? Well, Al, I want to talk to you about Irma. Oh. She loves you, and since she has no family within 1,500 miles, I'd like to talk to you like, well, like her father would. Fair enough. Now, Al, just what are your intentions regarding Irma? Well, Pop, I'll tell you. <laughs> I love Irma, and someday I hope to give her my name. What else? <laughs> What else? Yes, what are you going to do about a job? Well, I... I sent an application in. Al, that was a year ago. Boulder Dam is finished. <laughs> Forget about it. Al, you have got to go out and get yourself a job. Oh, now, look, Jane, you got me all wrong. I'm not against work. It's just that a man like me has got to pick the right spot. What do you mean? Well, I'm not the kind of a guy that can work for somebody else. I feel I'm a born leader. Got to do things on my own. Maybe I got that same drive that you find in men like Edison, Marconi, Louis Pasteur, and... and Rip uh, Van Winkle. Uh, <laughs> well, look, Jane, that's how I am, and nothing's going to change me. I'm willing to work. I want to work for myself. Oh, Al, that's ridiculous. Why? Richard works for himself. Are you comparing yourself to Richard? Why, why he's a self-made man. Richard could retire on just what people owe him. Well, I could retire on what I owe people. <laughs> Now, Al, don't joke I give you my word that unless you straighten yourself out I'm going to do my best to prevent Irma from marrying you Well, I've got to go down and meet Richard now But this isn't the last that you've heard from me Oh, hello, chicken Hi, Jane Hello, Al, honey Oh, Al, your ears are burning I bet you were talking about me <laughs> Yeah, chicken I was just telling Jane how much I love you Oh, Jane, isn't Al the answer to a girl's dreams? It all depends on what she ate before she went to bed. <laughs> well, I've got to run along now, kids, but you uh, think about what we discussed, Al. Bye. Well, what did Jane mean, honey? Ah, the dame burns me up. Just because her guy Richard is loaded with dough, she keeps harping on me to get a job. Well, Al, I think if you loved me, you would. If I loved you? 
Chicken, how can you hurt me like that? <laughs> hurt you, Al? If you only knew how thoughts of you stay with me everywhere I go. In the subway, the wheels go clickety-clack, clickety-clack. But in my ears, they're saying, erm, erm, erm. In the park, the wind caressing my cheek is just the soft touch of your fingers. Even in Coney Island, when I'm throwing baseballs, your face is always before me. <laughs> That's beautiful. I, I'm sorry I doubted your love. Don't want you to be sorry, chicken. Just want you to understand my problem. You see, there are two types of men. The weak-willed, who are always on the defense, and the strong-minded, who like to take the offense. Oh, I understand, Al. I've never found anyone more offensive than you. <laughs> Thanks, chicken. See, that's why, by nature, I can't work for anybody else. Well, why don't you work for yourself, Al? Well, that takes cash, chicken. And we'll just have to wait until I can get my hands on some. Oh, Al. Oh, what's the matter, chicken? I'm so tired of waiting and waiting and waiting. I'm afraid my children are going to be older than I am. <laughs> Can't be helped, chicken. Oh, back already? Oh, hiya, Richard. Hello, Al. Jane has been telling me that you've been making snide remarks, that I owe my success to the fact that I was born with a gold spoon in my mouth. Well, that's ridiculous. You would have choked to death. Oh. <laughs> Irma, please. Now, Al, what you say is not true. I had to work for my success. Now, I admit my father gave me $1,000 to get started with, but from there on, it was up to me. So what? If anyone gave me $1,000 with my business mind, you'd see a new sign on Wall Street. J.P. Morgan and Al. <laughs> oh, Al, I think your name should come first. After all, you're putting up the money. <laughs> Irma, Irma, will, will you just stay out of this? Look, please? Al, what, what you're trying to tell me is that the only thing you want is a start, right? Right. Okay, Al, I've got a proposition to make. Huh? Now, Jane and I are terribly fond of Irma, and her future welfare is our chief concern. Now, since you say you can't work for anyone else but must be on your own, well, we want you to have the same opportunity I had. So, here is my check for $1,000. Oh, I couldn't accept it. <laughs> It's certified. Oh, that's different. <laughs> okay, Richard, thanks. Now I'll show you. Now remember, Al, it's a loan and it must be used in a legitimate business. A legitimate, huh? <laughs> well, that may slow me down a bit, but I'll think of something. <laughs> That'll definitely slow Al down. February 9th, 1948, My Friend Irma on Classic Radio Theater with Wyatt Cox on your favorite radio station. So Al's got himself a $1,000 investment, but he has to invest it into something legitimate. Let's see what Al can come up with. We'll get back to uh, My Friend Irma. February 9th, 1948, here on Classic Radio Theater with Wyatt Cox. Well, it's been 24 hours since Al started out to set the world on fire with Richard's thousand dollars. So far, we've had no word from him. I'm not confident. Because knowing Al and his deals, I wouldn't be a bit surprised if he buys $1,000 worth of peas, whitewashes them, and sells them for pearls. <laughs> Honestly, I'm really worried. After all, I was responsible for Richard lending the $1,000. Irma. What, Jane? wonder what sort of business Al is going to invest in. Hello? Hello, chicken. This is Al. Now, let me do the talking. Don't want Jane to know it's me. You understand? Yes, Henry. Got great news, chicken. Just bought a sensational heavyweight. Paid the thousand dollars for his contract. He's got ten decisions and five knockouts to his credit. Well, that's wonderful. What business is he in? <laughs> Chicken, he's a fighter. Name is Billy Boy. Gonna make a fortune with this guy. I don't crack to Jane till I get there. Wanna see the way her eyes light up when I tell her. All right, George. <laughs> goodbye. Irma, I heard you say Henry. Why'd you say goodbye, George? Well, uh, uh, they're partners. <laughs> Irma Peterson, was that Al? Was it? Well, you'll never find out from me. Al would hate me if I told you. 
What business is he in? Well, I-, I can't tell you until he does. Oh, well, all right. Then I won't try to guess. There's no sense in my knocking myself out. Oh, you guessed it. What? Uh, knocking yourself out. He's a fighter. His name is Billy Boy. What? A fighter? Oh, Irma, you... Come in. It's only me again. <laughs> Jenny, why do you look so distressed? Oh, Professor, Richard loaned Al $1,000 to go into business, and he bought a prize fighter named Billy Boy. Sleeping Billy Boy. I know him well. <laughs> he was married to a little waitress in the gypsy tea room. They finally got a divorce. Fighting? Yeah, she was always beating him up. Ah, <laughs> uh, that's what I figured. Oh, why did I ever talk Richard into this thing? Well, maybe Billy Boy's making a comeback. Who knows? If they get the right match, he might win. Oh. Who with any kind of a name could he beat? Uh, Margaret O'Brien. <laughs> Come in. Hiya, folks. Well, I did it. Well, what's all the noise? <laughs> hey, Jane, why are you staring at me like that? You haven't heard the good news. Oh, you heard the good news. <laughs> well, I-, I didn't tell her, Al. She guessed. Al, how could you do this? Now, wait a minute. You don't even know the man. I admit the guy's been knocked out in his first ten fights, but he's coasting. (laughs) Wants to find the right spot. Where, in the morgue? (laughs) Now, look, Jane, I never was a chump, and I ain't one now. Got Billy Boy booked to fight gentleman Jim McKenzie, and I'm going to clean up? Oh, Al, you're out of your mind. Take it easy, Jane. Before you start condemning me, why don't you come down to the gym and take a look at my book? Let's go, Jane. Gee, I haven't been to a gym since I went to school. Wait a minute. Where are you going? To get my midi blouse and bloomers. <laughs> well, here we are at the gym. Al, myself, and the bloomer girl. <laughs> and over pounding the punching bag is Al's fighter. Yeah, there he stands. A mass of something. (laughs) I don't think he's very solid because the electric fan is on and he's rippling. (laughs) But he does have an interesting face. (laughs) Two large, bushy eyebrows. No, my mistake, that's his hairline. (laughs) The man has no forehead. I don't know how to describe him quickly. Let us just say that if you printed the word brandy on his Adam's apple, he could pass for a St. Bernard. (laughs) But I must say he has quite a punch. Now he's shadow boxing. He swings his right. He swings his left. Now he's down. I think his shadow hit back. (laughs) No. No, he slipped. Hey, Billy Boy, get up. What happened? Sorry, boss. It's this trick knee of mine again. (laughs) Trick knee? Yeah. Well, you didn't say anything about that when I signed you. Don't like to talk about it. Does it bother you often? Oh, no, only when I fight. (laughs) Every time I get set to throw a punch, my knee buckles. And while I'm bending over to see what's wrong, they let me have it. (laughs) But don't worry, boss. In a few days, I'm as good as ever. Well, Al, I have to congratulate you. Most promoters are satisfied just to buy a regular fighter. You, you have to be fancy. You have to get the collapsible model. (laughs) But he kept it a secret. The guy I bought him from said he was fast on his feet, very shifty. How should I know every time he shifted, he went out of gear? Well, Al, now that I've seen your fighter, I'll run along and tell Richard that he's poorer by $1,000. What a businessman. Oh, gee, Al, I think Jane's unfair. No, chicken, she's right. Billy Boyle get in the ring, and in one minute he'll be down on his knee. Well, that's not so bad. That's the way Al Jolson started. (laughs) But I can't sing. Oh, Al, don't be downhearted. Ah, please, chicken. What's the use of kidding ourselves? This guy is nothing. I've been taken, gypped, swindled. And there's only one honest thing to do. What, Al? Try to unload him on somebody else. (laughs) And in a case like that, there's only one man who can help us. Who, Al? Who else but... Hello, Joe. (laughs) Al, got a problem. Want to unload a boxer. No, not a dog. (laughs) Wait, I take that back. He is. (laughs) His name is Billy Boy. Yeah, that's the guy, yeah. Joe, I'm stuck with him. How can I unload him without people finding out about his knee? Uh Uh-huh. 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 Mm-hmm. Put Irma on his lap and sell him for a ventriloquist. (laughs) 
Look, Joe, I'm in no mood for gags. I gotta think fast. So long. Nothing doing, Al? No, we're cooked. Out of my way. I'm ready. I'll kill him. Hold it, Billy. That's not the gong. It's the... <laughs> Hello? Uh, hello, Stillman's Jim. I, I want to talk to Al. Yeah, this is Al. What do you want, Richard? I understand you're not the financial wizard you set out to be. Don't rub it in, Richard. Yeah, furniture. From February 29th, 1948, Marie Wilson and my friend Irma here on Classic Radio Theater with Wyatt Cox. We'll see how this mess rolls out, along with wrapping up a yours truly Johnny Dollar story when Classic Radio Theater with Wyatt Cox continues. Classic Radio Theater family, you know our friend Mike Lindell has a passion to help everyone get the best sleep of your life. He didn't stop by just creating the best pillow. He created the best bed sheets ever. They look and feel great, which means an even better night's sleep for me because, you know, I'm working like 67 hours a day. Now, Mike's offering the best deal on his Giza Dreams bed sheets ever. You can get a set of Giza sheets for as low as $29.98. You'll never want to sleep on anything else once you sleep slept on a set of Giza Dream sheets. A special offer for you right now. You can get a set of Giza sheets for as low as $29.98. Call 1-800-928-4715. Use the promo code WYATT or go to MyPillow.com. Use the promo code WYATT. It's good on anything on the website. That number again, 1-800-928-4715. Use my promo code WYATT. Classic Radio Theater with Wyatt Cox on your favorite radio station. Now the conclusion of My Friend Irma. This was originally broadcast February 9th, 1948. Now what I mean is that I hear that you took your investment and didn't put it in, shall we say, a solid piece of furniture. Well, he's solid, all right, but how can I know he'd turn out to have gate leg knees? <laughs> well, look, Al, uh, Jane's here in the office, and we want to talk to you. Come over here right away. You've gotten us all in a mess. I'll be right over, Richard. Goodbye. Chicken, it's murder. Can't work for others. Can't work for myself. Just don't know how I'm going to make a living. Oh, but Al, what if Billy Boy beats gentleman Jim McKenzie tonight? Oh, Chicken, he's got no chance to win. I tell you, the guy's a bum. Oh, gee, you sound like my own mother. <laughs> Well, I got to go square myself with Richard. I'll, I'll see you. You know, miss, I don't think he has any confidence in me. Oh, now we're ruined. <laughs> it's all your fault. Mine? You see, Al can't work for himself and has to be the boss, and Richard has always been the boss and has the money, so he lent Al money so he could be in business like Richard, who has a gold spoon in his mouth, which he got from his father to buy you. <laughs> That's a little hard for me to follow. <laughs> you see, I'm a little punchy from fighting so long. Well, then I'll tell it to you more slowly and clearly. You see, Richard wanted to invest, so he left Al invest in you because of Richard's girlfriend, Jane, who rooms with me. But you being a bad investment, I can't get married not to you or Richard. That is because I belong to Al. <laughs> Lady, how long you been fighting? What's the difference? All my dreams have been shattered. Now I'll have to go back to Wisconsin. Wisconsin? You from Wisconsin, lady? Yes, I'm Irma Peterson. How do you like that? I'm from Wisconsin, too. You are? Well, when's the last time you were there? Oh, not since I started fighting. They won't let me back in the state. <laughs> There's a big debate going on over me. What is it? Wisconsin is trying to prove that I was born in North Dakota. <laughs> well, they're ashamed of you? Yeah. You see, I never want to fight. Well, why not? You're big and strong and you're from Wisconsin. Have you no state pride? Yeah, I'd like to win so I could go back to Wisconsin, but it's my knee. The minute I get in a ring, it buckles. I look down, and the next thing you know, it's Fourth of July. Fireworks all over me. 
<laughs> well, well, don't look down when your knee buckles. Look up. Think of Wisconsin. It will give you courage. Well, I want my state to be proud of me. Tonight, when I get in the ring, I'm going to be a different man. I'll murder gentleman Jim McKenzie. Gee, I guess it was fate meeting you. Two lost souls, both from Wisconsin. <laughs> That's right. And keep it on your mind tonight when you're fighting. Wisconsin, the dairy state, the home of the contented cow. <laughs> the dairy state. Yeah, I must remember that. I must fight for dear old Wisconsin. Well, goodbye. I won't say good luck. I'll just say moo. <laughs> The gong for the opening round is just about to sound. Gentleman Jim McKenzie is coming into the ring, followed by his trainers. Here comes Billy Boy, supported by his trainers. <laughs> Al is beaming proudly. He's waving at the boxing commissioner with one hand and taking cigars out of the referee's pocket with the other. <laughs> now he's come over to join us. Got the hand of the Richard, Jane. He's got a great financial mind. Smart of him to make us all bet on McKenzie to beat Billy Boy. In that way, we'll get even and make a little. Well, things like that account for my success. And to use a Wall Street term, it's called protecting your investment. Say, here, here comes Irma. Yeah. What is she doing with a cowbell in each hand? <laughs> What's the difference? The fight's going to start. Yeah, sit, sit down. down. Sit down, Irma. Sit down. Ladies and gentlemen, the final event of tonight's Elks Club Smoker, a ten-round bout to the finish. On my right... Weighing 180 pounds, that pride of Boston, Gentleman Jim McKenzie. Hooray! What a prize! Money in the bank. And on my left, weighing 180 pounds, originally from Wisconsin, Billy Boy. <laughs> what is that, Irma? Well, Jane, you see, as soon as... Wait, honey, wait, the fight's starting. Shh. Well, there they go. Both fighters are in the ring. Gentleman Jim is pulling back his left. There it goes forward. And there goes Billy Boy downward. <laughs> well, folks, let's get ready to collect our money. Seven, eight, nine. Ooh. Irma, what are you mooing about? Oh, you'll see, Jane. See what? Oh, oh my goodness, what I'm now seeing, no one would believe Billy Boy is up. But not for long. He's down again. Six, seven, eight. Ooh. Oh, but you see, Jane... Oh, honey, be quiet. Billy Boy is up. He's a different man. Look! Now Mackenzie's down. Eight, nine, ten, you're out! <gasps> no! No! Billy Boy has won the fight! Oh, I did it, Jane, I did it, and it was all because of my mooing. What are you talking about? Well, we wanted Billy Boy to win, and when I found out he was from Wisconsin, I got him to fight like a man. Irma, this may be news to you, but your mooing has just cost Richard $3,000. You see, we bet on Mackenzie. Oh. oh, I'm sorry, Richard. I thought you wanted Billy Boy to win. That's why I mooed. You see, we're both from Wisconsin. Wisconsin? Irma, you were born in Minnesota. <laughs> well, this is a fine time to tell me. <laughs> February 9th, 1948, My Friend Irma on Classic Radio Theater with Wyatt Cox. Now on Classic Radio Theater with Wyatt Cox, part four of the five-part Years Truly Johnny Dollar story, The McLean Matter. This originally broadcast February 9th, 1956. From Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Dollar. This is the desk, Mr. Dollar. Your number's ringing now. Good. Hello? Hello. I want to talk to Dr. McLean. Who's calling, please? I'm not a patient. I just want to talk to him. This is Dr. McLean. I'm Johnny Dollar. I'm from Hartford, Connecticut. I want to see you. What about? About life and death, doctor. You must be drunk, whoever you are. Do I come to your office or do I meet you? If you come to my office, I'll call the police. Get busy, then. I'm on my way. <laughs> Tonight and every weekday night, Bob Bailey and the transcribed adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account. 
America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. (laughs) Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to Tri-State Insurance Underwriters International Building, Hartford, Connecticut. The following is an accounting of expenditures during my investigation of the McLean matter. Expense account item 10, $4, gasoline for my rented car. I was in the filling station at the Statler Hotel having it filled up when George Riley stepped out from the lobby entrance. Hey, Dollar. Huh, Riley. I came down here to see you. What about? What do you think what about? All right, get in. I got to thinking after you left me today about my girl, Terry. Then you know what happened? No. The police came to see me. They told me practically the same thing you did. They said they were getting up a court order to exhume the body. Her body, they don't know for sure yet. They'll have a job making the identification. My girl, Dollar. Yeah, you mentioned that. We both know it'll be her, don't we? Sure we do. They have to go through with all this legal stuff, huh? This has to be right. That has to be right before they can do anything. That's right. Yeah. Hey, where are you driving? Around the block. Dollar, you know what I'd like to do? I'd like to get my hands on the bird or put it down on the ground that way with somebody else's name. He was a doctor, wasn't he? That's what it looks like. Doctor who? You'll find out soon enough. Uh, Let me ask you something. How would you feel if you got the kind of news I got today, huh? You'd feel pretty lousy. Well, I feel pretty lousy. I was going to marry Teresa Corbett a couple of years ago. I built her a nice house on a hill. And she disappeared. Just walked out. Yesterday, you come in and... You say she didn't walk out. She walked into a doctor's office one night and had a heart attack. You say this doctor gave her another name, his wife's name. He buried her and collected some insurance. And that's how she disappeared. Now, what about me? Huh? They came around to see me after she disappeared. They came around a lot asking questions. And now they think they found her. You and me know they found her, don't we? Yeah, I guess we do. I spent two years waiting to find her, and now she's dead. Why is she dead? I can't answer that yet. But this doctor, he can't answer it, can he? He took her and buried her under another name, just took her like she was some sort of clay doll, something used and something no one wanted anymore. He took her and buried her, and that was supposed to be that. Now, what's his name? (sighs) Riley, you better go home for a while. Yeah, sure. I'll phone you later dollar. She wasn't any clay doll. She wasn't something you'd give a phony name to and put in the ground. She was what I loved and wanted and needed. Did she walk into his office and die with her heart trouble, or did it happen another way? I don't know. You got ideas? I don't know. I don't know. Dollar, you gonna find out? Yes. If you don't find out, I will. I stayed right there and watched George Riley lurch across the street and hail a cab. Then I turned back and found the freeway, rode it out to Sunset and all the way to the Pacific Palisades in the office of David E. McLean, M.D. Come in, Mr. Dollar. Sit down, sit down. He was a tall, broad-shouldered man in his early 30s. I shook hands with him and sat down. Well, that was a pretty startling telephone call, Mr. Dollar. I confess I was intrigued by it. You said you'd call the police. Well, I didn't. I don't know why I said that, really. (laughs) Tell me, what is on your mind? I'm an insurance investigator, Doctor. Or didn't a woman named Pauline Henderson call you and tell you I was in town? Pauline Henderson? Pauline Henderson. I don't believe that A friend of your wife's, Doctor, an old friend who worked with her once. The kind of a woman who would recognize a picture if she saw it. I don't believe I remember her. Then she didn't call you and tell you I was in town. Well, that's all right, too. She said she might do that, though. Don't you want to know why, Doctor? 
Well, I suppose so. Yes. Why? Because I went over to see this Pauline Henderson the night I got in. She was one on a list of names of people who might know your wife on sight. Oh? She got kind of upset about my going there and asking her questions. I don't blame her. I'm a stranger to her. She finally said she'd tell you about it. I said, go ahead and tell you. And so? You just don't have any questions about anything, do you? <laughs> I'm completely baffled by this whole thing. What's your point? Don't you really know why I'm here, Dr. McLean? I haven't the least idea, but I can tell you we're wasting a lot of time. This is a nice office, Doctor. How long have you been here? A year or so. Why? Starting out, it costs quite a bit of money for equipment like this. Rental in a building like this, doesn't it? I don't think that's any concern of yours, Mr. Dollar. I do wish that you'd say what you have to say or do what you have to do and get it over with. Hmm? I don't know whether you're so anxious at that. Try me. I've been pretty patient with you. You come here and talk about a lot of vague things that I have no connection with at all. You make a strange phone call. You appear as though you're trying to intimidate me. You mention an old friend of my wife's... Pauline Henderson. Yes. What has she got to do with it? Nothing, really, except possibly as a witness. Oh? Witness to what? To an identification. She said she might call you. She was worried about an investigation I'm handling. What investigation is that? I understand you once treated a patient named Teresa Corbett. Teresa Corbett? Last treatment two years ago, February 1954. I had offices over in Hollywood in 1954. Are you quite sure that you have the right doctor? I am. Well, I don't remember a patient by that name. What did I treat her for? A heart condition. Oh? Well, we'll soon find out. Corbett, eh? Teresa Corbett. Uh, when was this now? February, 1954. Mm -hmm. Well, I don't have anyone by that name in my files, Mr. Dollar, but it must be important if you came all the way to Hartford to ask about it. It's pretty important. Well, she might have come in for some little thing. In, in that case, I wouldn't necessarily have a history on her. I understand she came to see you quite a few times. Could it have been another, Dr. McLean? It was you. Well, that's funny. Oh, now, wait a minute. Two years ago. My wife was my receptionist then. She wasn't too good at keeping records. Do you suppose I could talk to her and ask her? My wife is dead, Mr. Dollar. Oh. I'm sorry I can't be of more help. I thought every doctor kept a record of all his patients if they just came in with a nosebleed. Well... Now you see that you're wrong. <sighs> now that we've gone through all this, let's get down to business. What do you mean by that? I'll come right out and say it, Doctor. You should have kept a file on Teresa Corbett. You should have kept that one above all things. The fact that you don't have one is going to make me believe a lot of things I haven't really believed up until now. What things? What are you talking I'm about? I'm talking to you about your wife, who isn't dead at all. What? Four days ago, she came to me in Hartford, Connecticut. She said that Teresa Corbett died in your office one night and that you identified the body as your wife's. What and what's you... more, you collected $10,000 worth of life insurance on her. Here's a picture of the woman who gave me that statement. Is this your wife? Well? All right, I'll tell you. It is your wife, Doris McLean. And she's still very much alive. And the story she told me in Hartford is pretty much the truth. I've never seen a woman in that picture in my life. I ran into one person here in Los Angeles who recognized her right away. I've got a list of eight more people who'd probably recognize her. I can go to every one of them and get their statements to that effect, but I don't think I need to. I've got a pretty long statement from Doris McLean herself. It tells the whole story. Would you like to read it? No. Then maybe you'd like to make a statement yourself. I have nothing to say, Mr. Dollar. I didn't think you would, Doctor. <laughs> On the strength of the evidence already assembled, I preferred charges against Dr. David McLean. He was taken into custody and arraigned for defrauding an insurance company. He refused to talk at the arraignment and afterwards when he was held in the city jail. Expense account item 11, $2.20 telegram. I wired Hartford advising Don Taylor of the events in Los Angeles. The following morning, I received an answer from him to the effect that he was bringing Doris McLean to Los Angeles. That should have made the case complete. That and the fact that the coroner's office had exhumed the body and it had been identified as Teresa Corbett. Well. Hello, McLean. What now? Oh, I thought we could talk. We can't, so that's that. We have your wife's statement how the whole thing worked. The coroner's man identified the body of Teresa Corbett. So? Your wife will be here tomorrow sometime. Her testimony will cinch it. Will it? You know it will. I want a statement from you. 
Look, we aren't in the courtroom now, McLean, but we will be. It'll be a tough case from top to bottom, but we'll get you, and we'll get you good. A statement from you right now might save you some trouble, save you two years on your sentence. Oh, you're here to give me a break. No, I'm here because my job says I'm supposed to be here. I wouldn't want to save you anything, brother. The longer they send you up, the better I'm going to like it. But I'm not going to push too hard for a statement from you. I'm just giving you the chance to have you say so right now and suggest that you go into court with a guilty plea. It's up to you. You know something? You'll never get me into a courtroom. Expense account item 12, 10 cents, one morning newspaper, which carried a complete story of the McLean case as well as the information that Dr. McLean had denied all charges and was freed on bail. That, along with his remark about not appearing in court, worried me. An hour later, I was out in the Palisades looking for his San Vincent home address. It happened to be a two-story building, but I didn't get up to his apartment soon enough. Hold it! Stop! Riley. You don't have to worry about your doctor friend anymore. You fool, you crazy fool. The court would have taken care of him. No. I wanted to do it personally. Oh, Riley. For my girl, Johnny. (laughs) For my girl. Now, here's our star to tell you about the final intriguing episode of this week's story. Tomorrow, a brand new, a rather startling statement from Mrs. McLean, without lies. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. February 9th, 1956, yours truly, Johnny Dollar on Classic Radio Theater. Visit my webpage, classicradio.stream, to learn about streaming our programs on demand. Also, they're on the iHeartRadio app, Spotify, Spreaker, TuneIn. Just search for Classic Radio Theater with Wyatt Cox. Thanks for tuning in. Thank this station. Support their advertisers. Tell all your friends the great radio shows are right here at this spot on the dial. Classic Radio Theater with Wyatt Cox on your favorite radio station. <laughs>